Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ISPRS VG29 meetup event. My name is Fabio Mena and I'm a researcher at the 3D Optical Metrology Unit of uh, Bruno Kessler Foundation in Italy. Together with uh, Professor Mark Shortis, Dr. Panagiotis Agrafiotis, and Professor Dimitros Carlatos, uh, we are chairing the Working Group 29 of the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. The working group deals with underwater data acquisition and processing for photogrammetry related tasks and uh, gather people worldwide with very different expertise but the very same passion for the underwater world. Uh, today, uh, today is the United Nations World Oceans Day. Uh, this year theme is the ocean life and livelihoods and I believe that being here together it's a, it's a nice message from our side another opportunity for us to raise uh, the global uh, awareness about the ocean. As you may also know, the 2021-2030 is the decade of, uh, of the ocean science for sustainable development. Uh, we, we, we absolutely need to strengthen the international collaborations and team up to provide tools to scientists and anyone involved in studying and pro protecting our oceans. That's why I'm very happy to announce that we got almost 70 registrations from 21 countries and 33 speakers. 34 yesterday we got the new one. That was a very enthusiastic response from uh, your side and I wanted for, to express my gratitude to all of you. Uh, I know that everybody had a very full agenda and nevertheless you did anything uh, that was possible to take part actively in this event. So uh, a big thank you to, uh, to all of you. As most of you know, uh, the, the ISPRS has more than 100 years history, and, and for those who didn't know that, it would be even harder to think that at that time, 100 years ago, photogrammetry was already a mature technique with the 50s history behind. There were no digital cameras or computers at that time, and other optomechanical solutions were used. The potential was huge, and cartographers, architects, archaeologists, engineers, and many others understood that it was necessary to team up in a scientific community to make photogrammetry the technique we know today. So on behalf of the working group officers, I hope this event may and many others in the future will start new collaborations and new scientific outcomes. I invite you to team up in a collaborative way, brainstorm together, share ideas and continue to innovate the world of photogrammetry as this has been done for, for more than a century. Therefore, I invite you to publish, uh, consider the, the ISPRS channels from the conference proceedings. If you see here the very uh, top of the slide uh, to the journal and the open journal, uh, and, and you can check the link in this slide. Uh, I, I will share this info uh, later on during the, the meeting. Also, as we are a very active community, I would like to remind you that there are also some other events as well as special issues from members of the Working Group 29 running at this uh, very moment uh, that you may want to consider. Uh, if you are interested, uh, I can also share this information to you all at the end of, of the meeting. Uh, now uh, I think uh, we can move to a few uh, instructions for the meeting. Um, the agenda is very full of, uh, of very interesting presentations. Uh, we have divided the, the day in, in three sessions, each of 40 minutes, uh, 30 minutes presentations, and uh, 10 minutes of a question and answer. I kindly remind uh, all the participants to keep their microphone off, uh, except the speakers, of course, when, this, uh, when it's their turn. Uh, we will use uh, Google Meet Chat only for technical communications and the Slido platform for uh, for interactivity purposes. Uh, um, um, when making the question, uh, please uh, address it to a specific speaker because we, we, will, uh, we will group together as a few presentations then it would be uh, probably would be difficult sometimes to, uh, to understand the, the question uh, to was addressed. So uh, I think uh, we could uh, try to make the test, an icebreaker test, I would say. Uh, I don't know if you managed to uh, join this, um, 
uh, slido.com uh, on your mobile phone or on your laptop i would then stop presenting here and i would uh, uh, present uh, Oh, okay, that's good. There is already somebody there. I hope you can see this blue slide. Yes. Yep. And then we can we can start with the with the first poll. So the first poll is a uh, multiple choices uh, question to you. What is your main areas of expertise? You can choose uh, uh, many of them if you, if you like. Let's see how many of you are connected to people, three, six, and so on. Okay, 17, 19. Okay, that's quite a good. Uh... So I will leave this on in the meantime. Um, and uh, I will stop sharing my screen. I will leave it on and then we will, uh, we will discuss it later on uh, during the question and answer um, uh, slot. So, before I would move to the first uh, speaker. Who is Nadir Kapetanovic from uh, the laboratory, Labo laboratory for Underwater Systems and Technologies. I hope you're there, Nadir. I saw you before. Yeah, yeah I am. <laughs> Good morning, Nadir. Um, I'll hand it over to you. So. Please, when you're ready, you can. Uh, you, you should be able to share the the screen. Uh, just a second. Mm -hmm. Nadir is gonna give uh, a pitch presentation on uh, on the group activities of the their laboratory at the University of Zagreb. Okay. So, do you see my screen now? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, once again, hello everyone. I'm Nadir Kapetanovic, and uh, as Dr. Fabio kindly introduced me, I'm a PhD student at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing here at, in Zagreb, uh, Croatia. Uh, so, our laboratory for underwater systems and technologies uh, was founded basically uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but its traces could be uh, traced back uh, 20 or even 30 years back by uh, now Professor Emeritus uh, Zoran Vukic and our current uh, team lead, uh, Professor uh, Nikola Mishkovic. So uh, the, the consistency of the team is that there's 13 or 14 of us since, since it's constantly changing. There are uh, two senior researchers as well, uh, Fausto Ferreira, our colleague here, is uh, also joining us. Uh, six PhD uh, students, one uh, project management staff, and also three technical staff for all the uh, mechanical engineering and uh, electronics. So uh, what do we do? Uh, basically, uh, we're robotics laboratory. Uh, so we're developing algorithms for navigation guidance and uh, control, uh, robot uh, diver or human robot interaction, uh, multi-agent systems and heterogeneous uh, fleets of uh, robots, uh, whether they're surface, underwater vehicles, remotely operated vehicles, etc., also underwater perception, uh, where photogrammetry in a way uh, comes into play uh, with the sensor fusion uh, image processing, uh, but also sonar image processing. Uh, what we're almost, uh, what we're most proud of actually is uh, the vehicle design, uh, since we have multiple vehicles which are built 
basically from scratch um, in-house in, in our lab, as well as uh, the newly developed activities uh, in the field of inter internet of underwater things. Uh, so our equipment consists basically of many, as I um, mentioned earlier, uh, diverse types of underwater and surface vehicles. Uh, for example, we have uh, two uh, remotely operated vehicles uh, with which uh, we uh, mostly do the, the visual inspection and uh, the preceding uh, photogrammetric uh, post-processing. Uh, also, we have uh, two types of surface uh, vehicles and basically uh, four types of uh, underwater vehicles, be they, be they torpedo shaped uh, or uh, the two uh, to the left below for uh, diver uh, robot interaction. Uh, from the sensory uh, standpoint, uh, we use uh, HD uh, cameras uh, as well as uh, various types of sonars, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, for example, side scan sonar, multi beam sonar, or uh, even forward looking sonar. So, we're looking into methods of using these sensors either for uh, fusing those data for uh, underwater localization or, uh, as I mentioned, also for uh, 3D reconstruction of uh, various shipwrecks uh, and the, the survey missions which we uh, which we perform. Uh, so uh, on this note, uh, we had a successful Bloomed project together with our colleagues uh, from University of Calabria, uh, led by uh, Professor Fabio Bruno. So the idea of this and the result of this project was actually uh, like multi-resolution uh, optoacoustical uh, model of uh, various uh, underwater cultural heritage sites uh, around Mediterranean, where we provided the bathymetric data from our uh, multi-beam sonars and our colleagues from University of Calabria actually took photos of all those uh, great underwater cultural heritage sites. And then uh, those two models were merged basically to be used later on for uh, augmented reality uh, underwater tablets with underwater localizations for uh, future uh, blue growth uh, tourism divers at those sites, but as well for uh, the virtual reality models uh, in small local museums uh, close to those underwater cultur cultural heritage sites. Uh, the current uh, project which partly uh, deals with photogrammetric uh, challenges is actually a Hector project, uh, which deals with a uh, heterogeneous uh, robotic system uh, for autonomous inspection missions uh, in viticulture, but also mariculture. Uh, so uh, the idea of this project and one nice result, which we are actually going to, to implement is the 3D construction of uh, vines in, in vineyards in order to, uh, based on those 3D models, detect uh, some diseases of, uh, of the vines. Uh, in viticulture, but also uh, to reconstruct or at least try to reconstruct the uh, the fish cages in the mariculture, uh, where there are many challenges, for example, the caustic effects uh, of uh, seawater uh, at, at close to the surface, uh, ever changing, uh, ever changing uh, color calibration uh, with uh, increasing depth, uh, which is uh, which is recorded by the ROV and many, many uh, other challenging challenges which we're uh, trying to, uh, to to deal with. Uh, so one of the nice outputs of our lab is also the, the international workshop named Breaking the Surface, uh, to which I would uh, like to, to invite uh, as many of you to, to participate since it's a interdisciplinary uh, marine robotics uh, workshop, but based mostly on applications. So uh, I think that the application of photogrammetry for underwater uh, world is is really important and quite challenging uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, it would be really nice to see uh, as many of you participating uh, this year, uh, at least a guest or even uh, getting a uh, having a lecture there uh, in Biograd na Moru uh, as traditionally this year uh, for the thirteenth uh, time in a row. So this was a short pitch uh, of our lab, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. Lots of uh, interesting robots, interesting uh, ideas there. Uh, I would move to the next speaker, who is uh, Professor Mark Shortis. Please, Mark, whenever you're ready. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Okay, now it's uh, yep. it's uh, starting. Yes. Okay. Good. 
Um, this is both an update and a bit of a request around um, this camera cali calibration database. Um, I was very see, very pleased to see in the in the poll that at least fifty percent of you are interested in camera calibration. So um, hopefully this will certainly be of interest to you. Um, the database was developed based on a grant from the ISPRS back in 2018. Um, it's been refined a number of times, so we've done um, requests out to a panel of experts to give us feedback, for example, on the information content. Um, and once we'd been through that phase, uh, we then established um, cameracalibration.org, uh, a test server, essentially, um, where the interface was written in PHP and the uh, uh, MySQL is the database um, in the, uh, behind it. Uh, it's currently populated with about 70 examples of camera calibration projects. Most of them are mine, um, but there are also quite a few that are examples from the public literature, so stuff that's freely available on the web. Um, clearly, um, it could have many, many more entries in terms of camera calibration. Um, you can access the system um, uh, very easily, the search function um, and some of the utilities um, here are um, freely available. You can do searching, um, but there is an added layer of um, security there. Um, you can register um, so that you can contribute to the database. So you can only view the database as a, um, as a guest. Um, you have to sign up and log in um, to then add some information to it. Um, we've had a couple of detailed reviews um, of the um, system and have used the feedback from that um, to make um, mostly minor changes um, to the way that the system operates um, and added some utilities as well. Um, further development really got stalled after 2019 because of the pandemic. Um, I guess like many of you, I was concentrating on converting all my teaching into online uh, which was um, the priority at that stage. Uh, so there hasn't been much development in um, the last year or so. Um, the next steps here are to um, transfer this um, database and the PHP code across to the ISPRS servers, which run um, MS, uh, Microsoft SQL, um, and then start promoting um, the database to the photogrammetric community. Um, this isn't specific around underwater work, but certainly there are some fields in the database about um, underwater aspects of calibration, and certainly that area could be expanded. Um, but my priorities have changed. I'm now an emeritus professor. That means I'm getting old, and it's time to have some younger people pick up um, these types of projects. So I'd be really interested if anyone um, is interested in taking over this project of um, advancing it um, some more, um, adding in more data, refining the database, and then in particular, promoting it to the broader photogrammetric community. So if you are interested, then I'd be very keen to hear from you. Um, please just send me an email. Thank you, Fabio. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. And I hope somebody will, uh, will show up with this very interesting uh, database. I think uh, um, we 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 many many times we we search for uh, some uh, specific camera calibration uh, file and i think this could be very very useful um so i would move uh, to the next speaker Thank, thanks mark again uh, next speaker is christian brauer bursart from department imaging and sensing of franover institute for applied optics and precision engineering uh, christian is going to uh, present uh, a structured light-based 3D scanner for subsea application. That will be a longer presentation. So, Christian, I'll, I'll hand over to you when, uh, whenever you're ready. Please share your screen. Hello, ever, everybody. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen, and I hope I select the right. Yes. Um, do you see uh, the screen? Yes, 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 I, I, I do. We, we do okay. see. Sorry for my pronunciation. Okay, because I only see. Yes. Thank you very much. I will talk uh, today about an uh, ongoing project, which, is, which we are just treating uh, together with uh, three enterprises and two research uh, institutions, uh, which are seen on that slide. 
Uh, the project is funded by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy uh, over the PTJ uh, organization. And what we uh, like to, or what we want to do is to uh, to develop a, a 3D scanning system uh, for the purpose of inspection, repair, and maintenance tasks at technical facilities and structures like pipeline systems, wind turbines, anchor chains, and uh, similar uh, structures underwater until a depth of uh, 1,000 meters. So it should be subsea uh, available. Um, for these uh, inspection tasks, uh, exact 3D data of the current uh, objects are necessary, and we try to do to to deliver these 3D data in a new quality, which has not seen before. So our general goals for the for the systems is that it should be uh, connected with a ROV and that is uh, in the sketch on the, on the right side to be seen the the, the gray uh, box is a should be the sensor system and the orange one the ROV and what we uh, like to achieve is that no preparation of the scene should be necessary we try to achieve a high measurement accuracy which means uh, lower than a millimeter and a high ob object resolution the measurement should be performed in movement of the of the rv until uh, a scanning velocity of uh, one meter per second and uh, continuous data recording and a an real-time um, building up of a 3d model of this scene should be uh, achieved the measurement volume size should be about one square meter in the area and in the depth uh, half a meter or maybe if we achieve more then it should be a little bit more uh, the typical uh, modus of, of the res of, uh, of the spatial resolution is about one uh, millimeter in the object space, uh, but we can use the, the double uh, resolution. We will record or, uh, until 900 uh, images per second. Uh, that means that we can uh, produce a 3D data rate until 60 uh, frames per second. Not all uh, applications, but for those where uh, Fast velocity is, is uh, and there we need uh, a lot of uh, over overlapping uh, uh, surface uh, uh, regions. So yes, I already uh, told about the application depth of one hundred uh, one thousand meters. What is uh, or what what systems uh, are available until now? There are used uh, systems uh, on the principle of photogrammetry, which provides high accurate, uh, measurement accuracy, but uh, needs a very high temporal effort to prepare the scene and to make the the photographs and and to uh, now. <laughs> To analyze them, uh, another another um, methodology is a laser scan, which is very fast and can uh, can uh, cover large measurement volumes, but it's not it's not so precise as we try to uh, try to achieve our measurements. And uh, another method is ultrasound techniques which is uh, very uncertain and uh, the same uh, the same principle which we uh, apply the structured illumination is available in the moment only uh, on very uh, small uh, regions 
and the available systems are mainly uh, laboratory setups and not commercially uh, sold uh, systems. So, but we can uh, build on, on an own developed uh, hand scan, uh, scanning system, which we developed a few years ago, which is seen on, on the lower two photographs. But now we have a lot of uh, sophisticated challenges. Christian, uh, sorry, more than before, which is sorry really, to interrupt you. Yes, uh, there are some issues with the sound. I don't know if it can help. Maybe if you can uh, uh, get closer to the microphone, maybe the quality increases a lot a bit. So maybe the others may may, may listen to you a little bit better. That there's something like a connection problem, okay. but uh, no, not to everybody. I, I I can hear you quite well, but somebody. Uh, yeah, that's probably a probably bandwidth problem. If you can just uh, get closer to the microphone, maybe the sound uh, quality increases. Thank you. Sorry for the... Okay, I try to be... Sorry. I try to uh, speak uh, a little bit louder and closer to the microphone. Um, there are a lot of challenges which are to be uh, solved. These uh, challenges are, for instance, uh, to produce ne the necessary power of structured illumination. Then, if you have some uh, such uh, large uh, volume of, of light, it means also heat. So we have to cool the, the whole system. We have to uh, overcome scattering effects in the image uh, analysis. We have a very big data volume, which is to be processed. And the move movements of the sensor and the objects uh, lead to the, ne uh, to the necessity to make a movement uh, compensation in the algorithms for the, for the 3D uh, image uh, calculation. So we have to merge the data for the final uh, model of the scene which should be also presented few uh, few moments after the recording and yes uh, and last not but not least the calibration of the system to achieve very uh, very accurate results is a big challenge so uh, I want to tell you about the current state of the of the system it, we have uh, realized a laboratory setup in the air which has not been uh, another until now it consists of two monochrome cameras for the measurements uh, to uh, to to uh, slash light flashlights for the illumination for the color camera which is used for the orientation and Finally, also for the mapping of color info to the 3D model. And uh, the third component is a projector uh, producing uh, fringes, uh, sinusoidal, uh, non aperiodic sinusoidal fringes, and uh, Gobo. Uh, and the Gobo system and the inside the uh, housing of the color camera there's uh, also an emo uh, for um, estimate the velocity and to to uh, get to uh, now uh, to, to record the uh, position the trajectory of, of the movements and the final component is a embedded PC which controls the whole uh, image recording and the data processing. So uh, for the uh, calibration and 3D uh, calculation of the of the surface points, we use an extended pinhole model with consideration of ray refraction, and uh, we. We constructed a new calibration uh, method which uses uh, air ca calibration and few underwater measurements for uh, extension with a 
uh, underwater components of the calibration that can be seen in a, or read in a publication which uh, is from the last year. So I will not go into detail. And we use for that calibration, we use such marker boards and estimate uh, certain parameters of the, of the underwater uh, situation. And after that, uh, refinement of the underwater calibration is performed. So that's a image of the laboratory setups. Uh, again, all components work together. We have uh, performed the calibration in air, and the uh, can, or the image recording and the three D measurement is uh, is working, and test objects also in movements. So we, we hope to uh, go underwater the next few weeks with that uh, that setup. So that uh, is a short summary. Uh, I think all all facts I already told you. And so and, thank uh, thank yes, you I, I, thank you Christian. I, I was very interesting update. Yes, thank on you very system. much for. Thanks a lot. Uh, we can move to the next speaker, who is uh, Bashar El Nashef from the Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, IFA. Uh, he's going to present um, the group activities, going to give a pitch presentation on, on their, on their uh, activity. I don't know if Bashar is, uh, is there. Hi, I'm hi here. Bashar. Whenever you're ready, you can uh, share your screen and uh, start your uh, your presentation. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Bashar El Nashef, and I am a PhD candidate under the supervision of Professor Sagi Filin in the photogrammetry and laser lab at the Technion Institute of Technology. Uh, what triggered our uh, activities at most was a joint project uh, with the Marine uh, Technology Department at the uh, University of Haifa that revolved around an AUV. Um, and so we started with the development of camera models for imaging uh, through uh, refraction. So we started with flat refractive uh, systems and identified the direct solution, uh, which is also linear and allowed for improved accuracies, both for pose and system parameters. Uh, we then extended this to uh, the thick layer case for deep sea applications and gained a more complete system modeling. Um, then uh, we turned to uh, uh, the two view uh, problem and realized that because of the axial nature of the system, the baseline can be estimated with no scale ambiguity. And uh, a Euclidean reconstruction can be performed uh, uh, with no scene knowledge whatsoever. Uh, one application of this uh, is, the, uh, uh, is the ability to detect, segment, and reconstruct uh, while eliminating motion with a within a dynamic scene. And uh, moving on to ongoing activities, uh, one element is the integration of system modeling uh, of calibration, both estimation and centering of a hemispherical port with radiometric image enhancement by utilizing the point spread function uh, of the system, uh, for example, and uh, which is something that can be learned also. Uh, another work involves active sensing. Uh, here, there are two elements. The first is integrating some geometrical models while taking advantage of what we know about refractive geometry uh, and adding it, this to the reconstruction itself. Secondly, introducing polarization imaging uh, to the system setup and to produce more refined and detailed reconstructions. Uh, and uh, one cannot, of course, be done without mentioning the two magical worlds, deep learning. So this is my current work right now. So I'm working on uh, feature detection, description, and matching uh, using deep learning architectures and uh, doing some work with depth estimation using a stereo and uh, uh, looking, uh, studying how this can be 
extended into a multi-view uh, scenario. And uh, uh, with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bashar. Thank you very much. I think uh, we can move to the next uh, speaker, who is Panos from uh, laboratory, laboratory of Photogrammetry of School of Rural and Surveying Engineering, uh, National Technical University of Athens. Uh, Panos is going to give uh, a long presentation sh on shallow water multimedia photogrammetry. Okay, thank you, Fabio, for the uh, introduction. Give me a moment. Oh. For some reason, I cannot uh, make full screen of my presentation. I don't know. Can you see my presentation now? Uh, yes, it's a bit, uh, bit small, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, I, I can manage I to see. Know. It Give me a moment, please. In the meantime, the participants may want to uh, ask questions in the in the related uh, tab of the Slido as uh, Erika and Mark uh, did already. Um, Mark was uh, more, uh, mostly was a comment. Uh, Erika also already asked two questions. Uh, if if you have any, of course. Okay, so may I start? Uh, yes. Yeah, please. I apologize for the delay. So my no name problem is at all. That's, uh, uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the National Technical University of Athens, uh, the School of Rural and Survey Engineering. And today I will try to give you a short overview of uh, our work on two media bathymetric mapping uh, for shallow water. So, um, shallow waters in, in the European Union uh, represent about the 2.5% of the seabed. And I am talking about uh, areas with uh, depth less than 20 to 25 meters. And even uh, it is a really small uh, area, it's really important for uh, navigation, construction, mining, uh, tourism, uh, lately marine litter detection, marine animal, animal forest mapping, and uh, especially in the Mediterranean for cultural heritage mapping. As you can see on this image on the right, uh, we are dealing mainly with uh, optically clear waters and not turbid uh, waters. So um, coming to, to coming to, to decide why uh, we should use urban multimedia photogrammetry. First of all, it's a very cheap alternative to to other state-of-the-art methods. Uh, of course, it is uh, very uh, useful for mapping very shallow waters, like uh, less than one meter depth, where a diver cannot be there. And uh, also for mapping very shallow waters from one meter to, let's say, 20 meters or 25 meters depth, uh, with less effort and lower res resolution uh, comparing to, a, to another water um, approach. Also, we can map uh, seamlessly dry and water-covered areas. However, we have to deal with uh, the major issue of uh, refraction. And uh, the major problem that refraction uh, poses is the violation of the collinearity equation. And as you can see on the left uh, figure, uh, we uh, are seeing a point that it's located on the seabed. We are seeing it on, on a, an apparent position. We have apparent depths that are uh, smaller uh, than the, the, the real ones. On the multiple view geometry, on the contrary, we are having uh, many intersections uh, based on the stereo pairs. So we are uh, getting a lot of noise on the, on the point clouds, except of the uh, apparent uh, depths. Uh, now, coming to the correction basics, of course, we cannot ignore the effects of refraction and we have to correct those. And uh, there are, are very mature methods uh, in the literature, uh, including analytical correction, uh, which are modified the collinearity equation, uh, image space correction, uh, which methods, uh, these methods are reprojecting the original photo 
to correct the water refraction. And lately, we are have we are having methods based on machine and deep learning uh, models. Uh, there are some of them that they are learning the underestimation of the depth and they can predict the correct depth knowing only the apparent one and they are working on point clouds or DEMs. And there are some more recent ones uh, that depend on uh, deep learning models that can predict the depth based on the RGB uh, plus information uh, of the scene. Now, uh, coming to what we have developed, we can see here that we have uh, developed um, an ML-based solution uh, that is based on uh, support vector regression. And actually, we are giving uh, to the model the, the apparent depths and we are getting back the, uh, the corrected uh, depths. This method is uh, also uh, improved by uh, an image correction method. So we are having the correct uh, bathymetry and then we are transferring this correction to uh, the initial imagery uh, delivering uh, non-refracted images. And this uh, helps us a lot uh, in the reduction of the, the photogrammetric noise, uh, of the noise of the SFM MVS as we discussed uh, before. However, uh, those two approaches uh, pose the need for the generation of some synthetic data. So we needed to, to know uh, the accuracy and the reliability of the depth. So to, to have a depth function, we needed to know the exterior and interior orientation of the, of the block. Uh, we needed to, to know that we don't have uh, errors and limitation in image matching caused by the visibility restrictions, caused also by the turbidity, caustics and sun glint. And we needed also to know that we have a really flat uh, water uh, surface, which is not waved. So in this uh, whole system of the synthetic data, the only unknown was the refraction effect. So we were able to model it uh, correctly. And uh, we did it this way. We uh, prepared two different DTMs uh, that resulted in eight data sets. Four of them were, uh, for the four of them, we introduced the refraction. And for the four of them, the rest of four, we uh, we didn't uh, introduce any refraction. The flight the flight height of these, those uh, data sets was ranging from 150 meters to 2,800. We used various uh, sensors and flight patterns, camera constants from 3.6 millimeters to 100.5 and image dimensions ranging from compact cameras to, to aerial photogrammetric uh, cameras. And here you can see the two different DTMs. Of course, this is, this is exaggerating the situation, but we would like to test some uh, things on the, for, on the noise of the point clouds here. And uh, using this data, we trained uh, again SVR models. As you can see here on the left, uh, we can see the different models resulted from the real world uh, data sets that they are not uh, overlapping. Uh, but on the right side, we can see, you can see the models uh, resulted from the artificial, the synthetic data sets, the, and they are almost overlapping. And this is very uh, good for us because we have consistent models that we can use in many other applications. So um, this approach, is, the use of synthetic data uh, reduced the, the accuracy of uh, the uh, reduced the RMS uh, in bathymetric correction uh, by 50% comparing when, uh, with the model strain on the real data. And we can see that most of them are satisfying the international organization exclusive order and only one of them, the special order. However, this is a very deep one. It ranges. Uh, till the 15 meters depth. Uh, we also achieved uh, improvements on the textures and the ortho images. You can see here uh, a texture of the 3D model using uncorrected images from a fraction and here the corrected ones. And here are some examples. Uh, here you can see an ortho image with ISO depth lines, uh, the, bathymetric, uh, the bathymetry, the digital elevation model, you can see also uh, an ortho image with ISO depth lines and overlaid the DM. And we are working also on semantic segmentation of ortho images and point clouds. Here you can see uh, another example. Here are some references. Thank you very much.
I think I was quite fast. Thank you, Panos. Thank you. It was necessary. I mean, we started a little bit later than uh, expected. Okay. So thanks again. Uh, now I think I will share my slide. Okay. That was the first poll. Okay, 33 persons uh, replied, voted this poll. And uh, we are currently 48. There are people uh, going, uh, still uh, joining the meeting. Some had to left. So mostly the participants are from the photogrammetric community, but uh, computer vision, uh, robotics is also there, hydrography, archaeology. Yeah, that's quite, I would say it's quite a broad, uh, quite a broad community this today. And I'm going to show the question and answer panel here. Uh, that the first one was uh, mainly a comment from Mark. And then there is uh, uh, Erika who asked uh, to Mark, uh, have you collected many underwater camera calibrations? Are camera plus lens and housing plus port considered as a single system in the database? And uh, okay, Mark already answered there. Uh, yeah, there are, uh, there are already a few examples in the database. And yes, the optical pathway is a single system. Um, then uh, again, uh, Erika for uh, Nadir and Fausto. How are you going to model the fishing net, which I assume is not rigid? I think uh, Fausto is there. If you want to answer, you can switch on your uh, microphone and, um, and answer. If not, I can uh, go to the next question for Bashar. Uh, Bashar, how do you plan to verify the improvements of uh, rigorous modeling? of refraction effects with both flat and dome ports in real applications. Uh, please, Bashar, if you're there and you can answer uh, this question for Erika. Okay, I, I have uh, a question for Christian. Um, Christian, do you plan to calibrate the system at the operative depth uh, to consider refraction coefficient and thermal variations on the on, on the, the entire optical optomechanical system? Yes, yes, we plan that uh, because our uh, refinement of the calibration will be should be short, and that should be applicable at the at the final depth of application so we are hopeful that it functions but we can we cannot say whether it, it will function well or not until we have not the experiments underwater okay okay i don't know if uh, bashar or uh, uh, fausto are still uh, i'm uh, here okay hi bashar please um Okay, so what we do is use uh, reference uh, uh, targets uh, with uh, known uh, dimensions and quantify uh, some uh, intrinsics uh, like planarity, collination, parallelism, orthogonality, and length. And um, compare it to uh, uh, do it in, let's say, 3D reconstruction error, like uh, find how a uh, well the uh, model uh, behaves in uh, uh, what kind of 3d reconstruction is uh, we are capable uh, of obtaining uh, is it clear is it clear uh, yeah I, I i actually i i it was a bit low uh, volume uh, okay uh, again but... so uh, uh, what we'll do is uh, 3d reconstruction validations uh, which we do uh, using uh, some uh, known target uh, with, uh, let's say, known dimensions and uh, uh, intrinsic geometry. And okay. uh, measure, measure some uh, metrics like planarity, collination, parallelism, orthogonality, and length. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if Fausto is uh, is there to answer, but uh, if not, I would move to the next uh, poll. Uh, this is a question that uh, we would like to, to, to pose to you all. Are you interested in benchmark data sets for underwater photogrammetry applications, uh, dimensional accuracy assessment, color correction, multiple sensors, integration and fusion, uh, species identification, etc. If you, if you need for your research these data sets and maybe you cannot uh, collect them or you don't have the means to uh, collect reliable uh, data sets, uh, um, if uh, uh, you feel uh, to, uh, if you would like to partici participate in a collection of uh, such a data set, or if you, if you already have a data set like that, and maybe you want to share, you want to discuss with uh, our community to see if this, uh, this is, uh, this is useful if there are uh, points to, to be improved. Okay, I, I will leave this on. Uh, um, you can uh, you can you can vote uh, till the, till, uh, the end of the second session. Uh, now uh, I will hand over to hand it over to Mark uh, Shortis, who will moderate the next uh, the next uh, session. Uh, the first uh, speakers will be Katia Ritter and uh, Christian Mulso from the Institute of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing of Technical University of Dresden. Uh, um, they are going to, to present, uh, uh, to give a long talk on troop water image and leader data acquisition and processing. So Katia, I don't know if who is going to uh, uh, talk first. Uh, so please, um, whenever you're ready, uh, you can share your screen. Okay, how can I share my screen? Um, down uh, in the lower uh, lower bar, there is uh, uh, leave call, and then there is an arrow pointing up in a, in a rectangle. You... Can you see it? It's a, it's a, in the very um, lower part of the screen. Yes, there I, should I, be. I found it. Okay, that's uh, you, you're sharing. Yes. Do you see my presentation now? Yes, we can. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to present the current research topics of our research group. Our group is part of the Institute of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing at the TU Dresden. It is led by Professor Maas and consists of David Marder, Christian Mulso, Hannes Sademann, and myself. I would also like to mention our cooperation partner, Patrick Westfeld from the Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency in Germany. At the moment, we have a joint research project dealing with LIDAR bathymetry in nearshore areas of the North Sea. The main research topics in our group are different aspects of airborne LiDAR bathymetry, through water image acquisition and underwater laser triangulation. First, I will talk about the airborne LiDAR bathymetry topics, then I will hand over to my colleague Christian, who will finish the presentation. Um, let me start with geometric modeling in airborne LiDAR bathymetry. As you certainly know, the LiDAR bathymetry pulse propagation is very complex. Um, to correct the raw measurement data for refraction and further propagation-induced effects, we need a geometric model of the laser pulse propagation. Conventional modeling approaches introduce certain simplifications, which affect the accuracy, accuracy potential of the measuring method. Our research group developed refined geometric modeling approaches 
which consider the local curvature of the water surface, the beam divergence, and take into account the diffuse reflection at the water bottom. The refined geometric modeling results in an improved coordinate accuracy at the water bottom. Please find all details in our current journal paper in the PFG journal. Let's move on to the next research topic, the nonlinear for wave box stacking. As you know, airborne light epithymetry is limited by water turbidity. In water bodies with high turbidity, it is often not possible to, to, to determine the water bottom topography with standard processing methods, as it is shown in the upper figure on the right hand. Therefore, our research group developed advanced processing methods, which increase the penetration water depth. The basic idea of the new processing approach is the combination of closely adjacent full waveform data using novel full waveform stacking techniques. The figure on the right, the figure below on the right hand, shows the results of the extended processing approach. Please find again all details in our current journal paper in the PG journal. Now I come to the last. Last um, ALB topic, the water turbidity estimation. In our research group, we developed a novel approach for turbidity derivation. The basic idea is the analysis of the signal decay, which uh, represents a measure for water turbidity. The full waveform analysis is applied to a combined waveform signal resulting from a voxel-based data representation. Compared to conventional point-wise turbidity estimation methods, a higher degree of automation and an area-wide estimation, turbidity estimation at much higher spatial resolution can be achieved. I will present the methodology at the ISPRS Congress and invite you to attend my poster presentation. Now I hand over to Christian, who will present the remaining research topics. Thank you. Okay. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. OK. OK. Let's come to the next part. Uh, so uh, if you know, if you have uh, uh, applications in underwater, uh, in underwater area, then you have to deal with refraction. Uh, and uh, uh, one way to um, deal with refraction, uh, I would like to present you in this slide. Uh, and we developed a model or to deal uh, with a refraction effects uh, during a multimedia bundle adjustment procedure. Um, we used in this model the uh, collinearity equation uh, and uh, due to refraction, uh, the collinearity between the object point, the uh, perspective center of the camera and the image uh, point is not longer be given. Um, but we can overcome this problem by just replacing the object point coordinates with the interface point uh, nearest to the camera. And here you can see the collinearity is uh, reestablished again, and we can uh, perform our adjustment as usual. Um, but what, what we have to do is uh, we have to reconstruct the uh, image ray path from the uh, object point to the uh, uh, to the image space. Um, this is called ray tracing, and uh, you have to solve this nonlinear problem pro problem first before you can solve your uh, adjustment. Um, due to this, uh, an analytical linearization is not uh, possible. You have to do this by numerical differentiation, with, which increase the computing time. Nevertheless, uh, this model uh, works perfect for us. And the big plus is that you can treat all parameters in this model as unknowns. So 
I refer for this publication for more details. And here is a field of application for this model. Uh, and uh, we use this model for uh, get, to get um, uh, DEMs, uh, digital elevation models from submerged areas. And this, in, in these two examples from lake bottoms, uh, we had uh, a data set, for example, here on the left uh, from uh, a lake in the Swiss Alps with nice clear water. And we uh, took within a UAV um, an uh, image block with high overlap and we were able to get uh, depth measurements down to four and a half meters. And uh, on the, the right side, you uh, see an example uh, in a bigger scale it was taken from an airplane. And uh, we had uh, for processing and an image block. And for reference, we had also data from a topo uh, bathymetrical laser scanner. And uh, we processed the uh, data from uh, both sensors and then we compared the data and we found out the, in, in areas with good texture for photogrammetry, we get close to both um, uh, data sets and uh, which uh, achieved high accuracy. Okay, I come to the last project. And this uh, is a project from my colleague, Hannes Ademann and he tried to adapt the known uh, principle of laser triangulation also for uh, underwater applications and uh, he placed a um, la laser light sheet projector and the camera in a glass box and he looked through this uh, uh, sheet of glass into water and due to refraction uh, he have to put more uh, brain work into calibration of such a system. Uh, as you can see here, normally you would expect uh, if you uh, use a light sheet projector, you get um, a yeah, flat light, um, a, a laser light sheet, but due to refraction, it becomes a curved plane and you have to uh, deal with that. And um, one uh, trick or procedure to, to calibrate such a system is, uh, to take measurements on two different heights. And uh, in the sketch, you can see the first, first sheet uh, is uh, constructed as a, uh, as a grid, uh, and the lower sheet is constructed as an ordinary, ordinary flat plane. And this grid uh, allows parts of the laser to get through the slits, and we have uh, projections of the laser um, uh, parts on both levels and then we can reconstruct the refracted laser light sheet. At the end, we have a calibrated system and we can do our measurements. I come to an end and I thanks for your attention. I'm, we are ready for questions at the end of the session, but I would like you to invite you to uh, publish your uh, research work on uh, the Journal of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, Geoinformation Science. Uh, and yeah, please contact us if you have interest to publish there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Christian and Katya. I appreciate the contribution. Um, and as mentioned, um, again, if you can put your questions in the Slido page, um, or we'll wait until we have a Q&A session at the end of these uh, presentations. Okay, our next presenter is Kimon Papadimitriou. Uh, Kimon is from Thessaloniki and uh, he's going to talk, uh, he's going to give a long presentation. So welcome Kimon. Uh, good morning, give me a moment to start my presentation. Is it okay, you can uh, get it? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So, uh, I'll... Okay, just a moment. Okay, good, good morning to all. Uh, my name is Kimo Vladimitri and uh, I'm teaching uh, at the School of Rural and Surveying Engineering at the Faculty of Engineering uh, at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. 
uh, as a diver and being a scuba instructor and with a background in mapping and topography, I'm leading the activities uh, of the underwater survey team at the Laboratory of Topography. And today we'll present in short the Science Diver project, uh, a less uh, technical presentation in the context of this uh, meeting. Um, well, the data that uh, derive from uh, underwater surveys are uh, essential for a wide range of uh, disciplines and applications that are related to the blue economy sector. And uh, particularly, dive-based research is considered a valuable tool in uh, scientific progress, which is strongly associated with the knowledge for the ocean and consequently for the sustainability of uh, our planet. Uh, while both ocean science and blue economy rely on researchers and professionals with advanced cross-sectoral skills, the existing frameworks for the qualification and recognition of uh, scientific diving is not harmonized neither in Europe or in a global uh, level. Uh, from another aspect, young people deserve to be informed for uh, the, the blue career opportunities and the students should have the options to follow a training path towards the sea and the researchers or professionals require the appropriate qualification to advance uh, for their advancements in the decade of ocean science for sustainable development that is uh, we are already running. Uh, okay, sorry to interrupt you, um, your, your audio is quite distorted. Um, perhaps yes. you could lower, lower the volume a little. Yes, please, yes, I will do. Now, how it is? Does it, it better? Uh, it's about the same, so maybe a little less. Less? Yes. How it is now? Uh, that's a little better, I think. So, yeah, that sounds cool. better. I, I'll try to speak not that loud, maybe. Please give me a signal if it is something that I can uh, uh, make it better. Okay, so, no, that sounds better. Please keep going. Okay. Uh, so, all the, the above uh, generated the idea of a focused research uh, on the field of scientific diving uh, that would provide insight on effective ways for the creation of a unified framework. And the project Science Diver, uh, cross-sectoral skills for the blue economy market, started in November of uh, 2019. And uh, it is a joint effort of three universities, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, the University of Calabria in Italy, the University of Stuttgart in Germany, a research institution Dan Europe in Malta, and three companies representing the advisory maritime industry. It is Atlantis Consulting in Greece, Envirocom in Germany, and the Marine Cluster in Bulgaria. The project is founded by the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund uh, under the Blue Economy, Blue Career School, and its main objective is to support uh, the blue and smart cross-sectoral skills uh, in order to meet the needs of the labor market of the blue economy. And also this project is supported by the Confederation Mondiale des Activités Subarctiques, uh, the European Underwater Federation and the Professional Association of Diving Instructors. Um, now, the, um, uh, the project uh, targets to offer uh, standardized training and uh, career pathways to diving scientists uh, within the European Union. And its main objectives are the fine tuning of policies, regarding training, career paths, and uh, professional uh, acknowledgement, uh, rising awareness of the youth on the potential of scientific diving, uh, building capacities of scientists, rising awareness of policy makers and uh, organizations, the development of a network of factors between higher education, diving associations, industry, and uh, national or European public authorities, or professional associations and the, the, the provision of a, an ICT supporting tool for the above mentioned uh, objectives. Uh, now the project uh, is, uh, uh, includes uh, three main phases. Uh, initially is uh, one for the mapping, uh, 
uh, of the landscape and the assessment of the needs uh, that uh, is being done with surveys and meetings. There is another one for the development of the tools uh, for the promotion of uh, the project objectives, and these include uh, the operation of a Blue Careers platform and the preparation of a training manual and the course outline uh, for scientific diving. And lastly, it, it will be a testing phase with the performance of a pilot training program and the provision of uh, roadmaps uh, at five focus countries in the uh, European Union. Um, now, uh, the, um, we are about in the middle of the course of this uh, project and the following steps uh, include the operation of an advisory board, uh, close meetings uh, with competent organizations and uh, stakeholders at five countries, uh, five roadmaps, one per focus country, taking into account the outcomes of the close meetings, uh, 50 B2B meetings with international and national stakeholders in Europe in order to optimize the roadmaps, uh, the operation of the Blue Careers platform and the pilot training program to be performed in three countries uh, by three universities, the establishment of the network uh, I mentioned before, uh, three career days at three universities and uh, a final international uh, conference. And... Um, uh, just to, uh, to, to conclude uh, in uh, this uh, effort, uh, the development of uh, a scientific diving framework for the training, legal and professional uh, matters, it is not uh, just uh, a way to, to enhance reciprocity among uh, existing frameworks, but uh, more importantly to advance the scientific diving in general. Uh, for that reason, we propose we already work in the establishment and operation of a pan-European advisory board with an independent legal status that will uh, drive the work already have been done so far uh, before or bef during this project, uh, after the end of uh, this, uh, this project. Uh, and one direction of this work targets to the development of ISO standards for scientific diving training, while the other to the development of uh, European U Directive uh, as a common base for uh, the harmonization in legal context in European level. And um, uh, something to mention about uh, all this effort, uh, Sorry, Kimon, I think we've lost you. Please? Is it? Ah, you're, you're back. Keep going. Please. Okay, maybe it is a matter of bandwidth also. Um, okay, so <clears throat> the promotion of uh, scientific diving, it is uh, something that covers multiple uh, disciplines and uh, should take into account uh, established regional frameworks or institutional frameworks and uh, but most of all should uh, derive uh, through the people actually involved in scientific diving uh, it is indicative in, uh, that uh, in our project there are participating uh, uh, individuals from a wide range of disciplines and uh, fields of activity Archaeology, biology, communication, media, uh, consulting, dive training, ecology, education, engineering, informatics, oceanology, oceanography, research, and all related to the blue careers, uh, to blue growth, the blue technology, diving safety, marine and freshwater biology, or uh, other underwater sciences. So I would like to thank all my partners in this project and uh, the, you, the attendees, and the organizers of uh, this meeting. Uh, so after this uh, event, uh, you can get in contact uh, with our project through our website, by email, and your the social media. I will be happy to answer in uh, any of your questions. Okay, thank you, Kimon. Um, again, we'll have a Q&A um, at the end of the presentations, um, or again, you can type your questions into uh, the Slido interface.
So thank you, Kimon. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Andrew Woods. Um, Andrew's from Curtin University in Perth. Um, and uh, Andrew's going to talk about a um, the Sydney Cormoran project. Andrew. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let me see which window I should be. Yeah, there's a little screen icon down the bottom. Yep, I'm just trying to make sure I, I select the correct one and not sharing you my, my email. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me know when it comes up. It should be there. Yeah, it's just coming yeah. through now. Yep, we can see it. Good. Okay. Well, thanks for the opportunity to present. This will be very short and sharp. Um, this is about uh, some work we've been doing reconstructing um, uh, 3D models of shipwrecks, specifically uh, three different wrecks. Oops, let me get the, advance the slide. Um, HMAS Sydney 2 and HSK Cormoran, which sank off the coast of Western Australia in uh, World War II. And also the Australia, Australia's first submarine that was lost off the coast of Papua New Guinea in um, in World War One. Um, in 2015, we conducted the survey of the wreck sites of HMAS Sydney 2 and the HSK Cormoran. We took two uh, deep water work class remotely operated vehicles down to the two wreck sites, uh, about 200 kilometres due west of uh, Shark Bay off the, uh, the coast in two and a half thousand metres of water. The two underwater vehicles were fitted with um, a custom lighting and camera system. So about three kilowatts of lights producing about three, uh, 200,000 lumens. Um, five digital still, sorry, seven, 14 digital still cameras across two vehicles. Um, uh, several high definition 3D video cameras, a ton of cable and um, um, uh, interface boxes and a frame that could lean forward. And uh, all that was doubled. So after four days of surveying the two wreck sites, we collected, had come back with um, over half a million photographs, about 300 hours of high definition video, constituting about 50 terabytes of data. So this was um, um, some of the initial processing of those results. And I was actually thinking this actually might be a useful benchmarking data set um, if people are interested in this particular um, data set here. So this is probably about a thousand images or maybe more. Um, of an item that um, uh, broke off the uh, uh, the wreck of HMAS Sydney. It's a high altitude uh, director tower or uh, range finder. Um, so the uh, the big job that we're working on at the moment is the data processing. Um, with 500,000 images to process, there's a lot of um, data to work through. We've been using the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre, which is uh, uh, one of the most powerful supercomputers in the Southern Hemisphere. It's currently receiving an upgrade. We've used about 6 million core hours of processing on that machine to date, and uh, we're aiming to produce extensive and detailed 3D models of both wrecks and debris fields. Um, this is um, uh, some of the most recent um, results of this. This is just a point cloud, so it's an intermediate uh, stage of the processing. But this is the superstructure of the cormoran. Um, it's about 45% of the wreck was remaining after a large explosion of its um, store of uh, sea mines. And this has been developed from about 50,000 images. So as, as I mentioned, this is just um, uh, an intermediate stage of the processing. And after this, we'll have to do the meshing and the texturing as well. But uh, this is the first chance we've had to see um, such a large portion of this particular wreck all as one object. And it's uh, certainly a, a fascinating uh, view to be able to see this. Um, so um, visualizing these kinds of data sets, we uh, I'm, um, manage a facility called The Hive. Um, my name probably comes up as The Hive because I realized uh, Google logged me in as The Hive account. Um, and in The Hive, we have this large wraparound um, 3D projection screen, three meters high, 180 degree field of view. Petra's on the right, I'm on the second right. And um, um, yeah, so we're able to fly through those 3D models. Um, we can also view those that content um, in a, a virtual reality headset. And uh, we can also 3D print some of the items as well. And that's that same um, high angle director tower. So I think that's my five minutes um, and just an overview. But um, uh, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Andrew. There are some impressive statistics. Okay, we'll keep moving. Um, our next 
uh, presenter is uh, Petra Helmholtz, who is in, in the photograph, in the uh, image there. Um, and Petra, again, is a short pitch presentation talking about some coral reef mapping. So, Andrew, if you can stop presenting, thank you. And Petra, if you can turn on your screen, please. Thanks, Mark. I tried to share the screen. Uh, let's try if it works. Um, here we go. All right. Can you see the screen? No, it's yes, it's we coming. can. It's just coming up now. So thanks yeah. for for introduction, Mark. So my name is Petra Hemmots. I work together with Andrew at Curtin University, and I'm a senior lecturer in the field of photogrammetry. Um, Andrew uh, introduced a work about the shipwrecks, and I would like to introduce a work about coral reef mapping. And I would like to emphasize that while I have the pleasure to present today, um, there's a whole team behind it, and some of the um, uh, some of the team members have a very diverse background, including marine ecology, uh, physics, uh, and mathemat mathematics as well. All right. Um, so what we try to do together with the marine ecologists uh, to verify uh, or to validate if the uh, three D reconstructions we can create from reefs are precise enough. Um, so we have a good water tank facility on campus, and we have a couple of reefs which um, we can use for that. So that's um, it's one of the small validation tests where students try to 3D scan um, reef structure using an Arctic Space Spider a camera, which is um, precise to around 25 of microns. And we compared the coral reef structure we created based on the with the reference sensor of our photogrammetry, and could basically validate for the marine ecologists that um, we can achieve the uh, precision and accuracy uh, they require. Um, we have done a couple of tests regarding the uh, finding the best set of uh, of images, uh, best number of images and control as well. Um, and if you're interested, I'm happy to provide you with more information about this later on. Um, that could be a benchmark test as well, because while well, we have a very precise model of the reef existing. Um, but overall, the aim is not to map reefs in water tanks, but to actually do it off the coast of WA. So we work together with the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions and um, we help them processing the data. So uh, once a year, they go offshore to Karatha, which is in the northwest of Western Australia, and capture a whole bunch of reef structures. And the aim of uh, the marine ecologists is to verify the growth of the reef structures. So we were able to process the first, uh, process the first data set. We're waiting for the second data set to, in order to validate if we can detect the growth rate. Uh, while we work together with marine ecologists, um, it's very important that um, we find um, optimal paths for calibration. And for example, to put a calibration frame always in the field of view of a reef is uh, not practical. So we, we try to work together um, to find the best in-water procedure so we can still achieve the accuracy we need for the analysis. But without the impact of work of um, the people in the field too much. For example, if you just see to the top right corner, we have this uh, text, the yellow text, which we can use as ground control points. But it takes them around one hour to put one of the texts into place because the lovely reef around, or the rock structure around is uh, based on iron ore, like lots of things in WA. And it just takes ages for them to do. Um, then uh, we have a couple of side projects as well, uh, which is related to the um, ROVs, for example, the blue, uh, blue robotic ROV. I know that there will be a number of talks tomorrow. Um, we have Ian Pendrum, whose uh, his field is in sonar. So we try to also implement into the workflow um, sonar or side scan sonar images and then try to perform automatic classification. Um, or another system which was developed by one of our master students, the image-based system, which you tow behind the boat. So you have all of your camera systems built into this tube, 
that's towed behind the boat, and then we can try to calibrate or recalibrate the offsets between the GPS antenna um, and um, all of the positioning sensors on the boat in order to uh, get the uh, uh, the georeferencing of the of the buoy, and then based on that we can uh, try to scale um, and um, the the photographic product uh, which we have at the end. One of the things I would like to mention very briefly is one of the one of my uh, interests. So so far, I presented all of the work I do together with others, who are mainly not surveyors, um, but I work together with Derek Lichty quite closely as well, in order to quantify the impact of chromatic aberration, especially when you want to be very precise in your measurements underwater. We have heard about refraction, but the refraction also actually impacts the different color bands differently, and therefore um, chromatic aberration has to be considered. And especially if you use consumer grade cameras such as the GoPros underwater, we could find that there's significant lateral chromatic aberration, um, yeah, which has to be dealt with if you want to create precise measurements. And that's it from my side. And if there's further interest, I'm happy to provide with links to papers and other references. Thank you very much, Petra. Um, again, hopefully we'll get some questions at the end for you. Okay, our last presenter in this session is Fabio Bruno. Uh, again, another longer presentation. Um, and uh, Fabio is going to be talking about video games. I'm sure we'll find this very interesting. Thanks, Fabio. Thanks, Mark. And uh, good morning to everybody. So uh, I'm uh, presenting the, the, the works that uh, we are going, we are doing in a uh, couple some projects, in some European projects. Um, some are belongs to the University of Calabria and some to the 3D Research, which is a enough company uh, from the University of Calabria. So um, mainly we'll, we'll talk about how to use and use the 3D models that are generated by uh, underwater photogrammetry and also underwater acoustic and in some cases by merging them. What we, um, the questions that we have in mind when we, in our work is how to protect the underwater natural cultural sites and uh, uh, also how to stimulate the interest, to raise awareness, to generate value, uh, to make accessible this site to non, to non diver and uh, in general how to improve also the diver experience by providing some valuable tools also to divers. So, Several questions that may be addressed by the use of technologies that uh, are built over the 3D model that we generate with the uh, underwater photogrammetry. Underwater photogrammetry, you know better than me that uh, now it's very uh, widespread technique. We use it several times in our work for uh, making mostly uh, cult reconstruction in, uh, for cultural heritage. Here you see uh, the, the model that we created uh, that was mentioned that also by Nadir because we worked together there. Uh, that for the Blumen project, it was a, a classical shipwreck uh, with a thousand of amphora. And uh, we may create very detailed model as most of the, let's say, researcher and also photogrammetric user, I would say, in this area do. Uh, another case, uh, another, let's say, case study is uh, for this uh, modern shipwreck uh, that was a bit challenging for the depth uh, and for the particular, let's say, uh, structure that required some attention in planning the dive. But at the end of the day, the result was quite good also thanks to, let's say, to the post-processing, obviously, that the modelers, the, the graphic designer do on the result of the photogrammetry. Uh, first, uh, we started in six years, seven years ago with the, the virtual diving application, so to enable people to enjoy the experience of the diving by using a virtual uh, helmet, so a head mounted display, and to, uh, uh, to have this uh, experience on the water to visit the sites and to see uh, with the same feeling of the, let's say, the diver, and uh, also receiving various information and uh, through point of interest, through storytelling, through also uh, augmented, let's say, hypothetical reconstruction embedded in the virtual diving. 
There are a lot of ex uh, examples that we've done and that you could uh, see in, our, in the various project websites, uh, especially with some particular interest res uh, result in the MRI culture project. And also, uh, again, in American culture, we also use the um, and try the, the possibility to uh, enable the underwater augmented reality. Thanks to underwater tablet connected to uh, acoustic localization system, um, and also using visual inertial photo, um, odometry, uh, we um, tested, developed and tested the, the, one of the first cases of underwater augmented reality that was, a, uh, that enabled the diver to see uh, the, his posi their, their position on the map to collect it, to have information from the point of interest and also to see the hypothetical reconstruction of the ancient remains. In that case, we were in Baia, that is a submerged Roman city. So the people were, are able, because the system is in, is in action there, uh, the people are able to see how the villa appeared in the past, uh, thanks to the, the water tablet, to, uh, let's say, an augmented reality interface. So looking around with the tablet, you see the various, the, the, the construction from the various point of interest in a, let's say, um, interactive way. And this um, the weather augmented reality concept is something that we are still promoting and working a lot and uh, trying to, to put uh, in future projects uh, because there are a lot of potential in different case studies, uh, different, uh, not only for divers and uh, various kind of shipwreck and structure, but also for snorkeling. It may be also for uh, uh, biological, let's, let's say, naturalistic diving, uh, where it could be also combined with artificial intelligence to provide information about what you are doing. Finally, uh, a final, uh, another use of the uh, 3D models is uh, something uh, that is very exciting for us, that is the development of this game that is available uh, for free on the store. This is uh, for mobile, uh, smartphone and tablet, for mobile device. It enables the people to dive in four underwater sites, um, from classical shipwreck up to World War II shipwreck passing through Venetian time and Roman time. Uh, all, a part of diving virtually there, uh, you can see the hypothetical reconstruction of the site uh, of it appeared, thanks to, let's say, uh, some storytelling that you have to, uh, to that brings you in a, in a story that narrates uh, some hypothetical episodes about the, uh, the, the, the site. So try to, to provide information to the narrations of fictional let's say, stories. That was something that seems to be very exciting also to the people that use it. Here, a, a short uh, trailer of uh, the, the game um, that where you see that there are some parts that where you dive uh, underwater and try to, to accomplish some task. The task is to place some hypothetical scanner and this scanner allows you to see the augmented reconstruction of the shipwreck or the site. So you will go back to the past to see how they appear. And then there are also the stories and some small games that uh, uh, you have to complete in order to, uh, to go to the various sites. So you start in one site and to proceed, you have to accomplish the various tasks that are uh, assigned to, to you. So you can, if you wonder, uh, you may play these uh, by simply downloading them from the App Store and Google Play. We are actually, uh, we are around 20,000 20, downloads and we hope to do that. There is also a virtual reality version for uh, this game uh, using the Oculus Quest. Uh, it's uh, mainly the same environment, uh, mainly the same storytelling, it changed just in direction, and it is available also on the Oculus uh, Store. Uh, that's all, uh, I was in the time, that these are the, um, the links to the various projects that some of them, some of the results that I presented belong to this project, so they are obviously in, in collaboration with a lot of partners, but it's, sorry for not mentioning all of them. Okay, thank you very much, Fabio. Okay, 
Um, we have a few minutes. In fact, we're running a bit ahead of schedule, which is great. Um, so um, we have a few minutes for questions. And I notice in um, Slido, um, Erica, you've got a question for Katya. Have you applied the method for estimating water turbidity on both inland waters and at sea and up to what depth? Um, if you'd like to turn your microphone on. Yes, I can answer the question. Um, so far, we have applied the water turbidity estimation method. No, sorry, Katya, can you speak up a little? You're very faint. Okay. I put the microphone to my mouth. So far, we have applied the water turbidity estimation method on an inland uh, water data set of an inland river with a water depth of uh, about two meters. But we are planning to use ocean data sets too, of course. But so far, we uh, did not do that. So if anybody has a data set for us, a test data set, preferably with turbidity reference data, uh, that would be great. OK, thank you, Katya. Uh, so do we have any other questions? Yes, we do. Um, Eric is um, asking the question um, to Kurt, and I presume that's um, you, Andrew. Yes. Um, how do you usually locate a wreck before carrying out the detailed survey? So uh, we usually let someone else do that first. That's that's a, a really hard part, and that's usually done using uh, deep deep toe side scan so sonar um, to to locate the um, location of the wreck. Once it's identified, then we can go in there with an underwater vehicle or an ROV and uh, take lots of photographs so we can reconstruct it into a 3D model. Um, and Andrew, while you're on the line, as it were, um, you're using the supercomputer facility. Which, which software have you been able to run on a supercomputer? Well, that's actually the big problem. You can't run Windows or uh, other, other systems on, on the supercomputer. So uh, we're actually developing our own pipeline. So we, we routinely use um, uh, commodity software for smaller data sets. But for these much larger data sets that we you know, intend to run on a supercomputer, we're actually developing our own pipeline. So we've actually just um, finished the uh, processing of the feature matching, which is the second stage and uh, are starting um, to um, uh, do the work on the, uh, the bundle adjustment and um, uh, uh, the sparse point cloud regeneration at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, another question uh, again from Erica. Um, so it's uh, um, Fausto uh, and I know we've already asked that question, I think, before. Is that correct, Fabio? Yes, I think that uh, there is a question for Petra. Yeah, I answered in the in the questions to Erica, but if she has more questions, I can answer. There is a question for uh, Fabio yeah. Bruno, I think. Yeah, I see it. Oh my God. So, uh, yes, we tested the system underwater. There is also a paper published. I will uh, post the link uh, on the um, on Slido, so if someone interested can see it. The feedback are um, quite good. Uh, we um, are impressed of, uh, let's say, all easy words to use it for uh, also the first level divers, so people that are learning to dive. Uh, Recently, let's say, <laughs> and uh, what we feel about to, uh, very much at the beginning was the, um, the size of the tablet that is quite big, but since it is uh, almost neutral, uh, they are able to manage it with one hand, and so uh, the, it doesn't, doesn't create uh, any particular problem. Uh, and uh, we changed the, we refined the user interface uh, for almost uh, two years. Of research because we did two years of testing in uh, several campaigns and uh, at the end we made we made it very very simple with just a few and easy to use uh, functionalities that uh, re that reduced the minimum the interaction task uh, required to the user to have the information 
Um, so maybe uh, more details on the numbers and uh, let's say the scores that we had in the test, the formal test that we did, uh, can be found also in the paper. Thanks, Erika, for the question. Okay, thanks, Fabio. Okay, are there any other questions that we haven't answered? Uh, I think no. I think we we answered all the questions. There is a new poll that's uh, more or less the continuation of uh, the previous one, and we can leave it on. And uh, I think if Panos is ready, uh, we can hand it over to Panos for the last session. Mm -hmm. I am ready. Okay. Okay. Panos, so whenever you want. Yeah, I welcome you to this last session for today. And the first presenter is Gottfried Mandelberger from the Department of Geodesy and Information of TU VN. And he will talk about, uh, about uh, UAV bathymetric LiDAR. It will be a long presentation. And Gottfried, please, uh, the screen is yours. Okay. I hope you can see my screen and hear my voice. Yeah. And if this is the case, then um, hello, everybody, and um, uh, welcome to this uh, presentation about um, UE born uh, bathymetric LIDAR. And uh, well, the takeaway um, message which I have to, uh, which I want to give you is a part of the, of the subtitle. Um, we are now with UEV born LIDAR bringing airborne la laser bathymetry from the let's say meter range to decimeter resolution and to centimeter accuracy. And that's basically uh, it. And I think um, this slide probably um, summarizes it. Um, um, why is this the case? What, 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 what we see here is a um, uv borne LIDAR bathymetry river cross section, very detailed topography, vegetation, water surface, underwater, um, underwater topography. And uh, we achieve this by flying low. Um, 50 meters above ground level, something like that, with a, a scanner providing a very high point density, um, um, which gives us more than 100 points per square meter. And that's not all. Um, uh, what also we uh, get from UV LiDAR is, um, UV bath LiDAR is a small point distance on the one hand side and a small laser footprint diameter. Think back, um, if you are familiar with uh, bathymetric LiDAR from uh, manned airborne platforms, uh, then we're dealing with, uh, let's say, laser footprints in the range of one, one meter, half a meter, something like that, but not below. So you're not able to, um, uh, to detect smaller objects than, uh, uh, than uh, something like 50 centimeters. And with UAV born a bathymetric LiDAR, we are now breaking this, um, uh, th this limit and uh, come down to a sub this decimeter resolution level and to a very high um, accuracy, especially if we are uh, thinking about uh, the, the one of the, uh, the other high end instrument, which is now available on the market. So we get detailed submerged topography, we get vegetation, we get underwater um, objects as well, like um, driftwood, submerged driftwood um, and the like. And this is all uh, possible by mounting uh, by sensor miniaturization. Um, and what we do have uh, now is compact la uh, laser scanners, which can be. Uh, Godfrey, Godfrey, yes. Godfrey, sorry uh, for the wrapping. You. We see only the. We will not see your full screen. It's uh, only your first slide here. What do you see now? Now the uh, AUAV uh, is carrying this LiDAR. And this is now in full screen mode? No. Okay, it's then, on the... okay, then I'll leave, okay. leave it like that. Um, and now I, I think you see my, my PowerPoint surroundings, but I, don't, I think this, this, this should uh, work fine. Like, yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Then I think the presentation mode is not running. Yes. Okay. And this, yeah. uh, this is all uh, made possible by sensor miniaturization. As I said, we are now speaking about uh, uh, lightweight and, and, and compact laser scanners, which can be mounted on, on UAV platforms, especially on octocopter platforms. Um, there are a couple of instruments on the market. On the left-hand side, you see a very lightweight uh, 
but not so um, accurate uh, instruments like the Astralite or the Amuse One cell from a Japan uh, pro product, which are in the in the range of several kilograms, but uh, only provide a depth penetration of something like um, one second depth. On the right hand side, we have two instruments which are on the, on the high end sector. The Fugro instruments with uh, about 14 kilograms is more or less um, suited for integration on, on light aircraft, uh, but the real system with 12 kilograms can also be integrated on unmanned aerial vehicles. That's the very instru instrument where I do have, um, let's say, personal experiences uh, with the, uh, the uh, here you can see the, the, the sensor in the, in the air carried on a uh, UAV, so we have this uh, compact scanner here, or well, the compact sensor consisting of a scanner and an inertial measurement unit and a camera, and together with the GNSS, this is then a full uh, airborne laser scanning uh, system. Um, uh, it is, uh, the, the, the scanning is conical as it is um, very, very often used in about metric LiDAR with a uh, forward tilting of 14 degrees and a sideward tilting of uh, 20 degrees. Some sensor specifications, um, the pulse repetition rate uh, can be uh, controlled between 50 and 200 kilohertz. And um, what is um, uh, very interesting on this instrument is that also the beam divergence can be, uh, is, is controllable, user controllable uh, between one and six millirad and at a fl uh, flying altitude of 50 meter. This then brings us a, or a result in a laser footprint of five centimeters to 30 centimeters. Um, I've already spoken about the weight and depth performance of this system is uh, two-fold second depth, which is um, quite remarkable, I think, for airborne laser scanning uh, bathymetric systems. Uh, we tested the uh, system several times, last times in March to 2021. Uh, very good uh, conditions on, on, on this uh, uh, date concerning weather and con uh, con concerning, let's say, atmospherical uh, conditions and also water clarity. Uh, we had uh, 17, uh, uh, all in all 17 flight strips here on the uh, Pilach River, which is a pre-alpine gravel uh, bed river, the right-hand tributary of the Danube, uh, meandering river, as you can see here. And uh, here follow a, a couple of slides with the, with the let's say, uh, results here. This is the refraction corrected uh, point cloud of topography on the one hand side here, the, the, the gravel bank with the vegetation on the left hand side and here the riverbed. And you can very clearly see that we also get now um, uh, details on this uh, submerged topography like boulders, as you can see here. Or on the next slide, we'll see um, uh, dead wood here. And part of the dead wood then um, comes into the river as driftwood. And we see here the, um, uh, the, the, the part of the vegetation below as well as under uh, the water table. So the submerged part. This is a slide which shows the uh, which shows a single stem, a single submerged stem, so we can clearly identify the underwater vegetation here in uh, this uh, in this bathymetric point cloud. And here, a uh, second example. This is an entire tree, a willow tree, which were, which fall into the into the water, and we even see these the the, the single um, the single branches of this. Um, submerged vegetation. And of course, there is much more to say about um, UAV LiDAR, and I think that I leave it uh, at, at this point, and the, the takeaway message uh, certainly sh uh, should be that with UAV-borne topographometric LiDAR, we are bringing airborne laser bathymetry from the resolution side on the uh, sub-decimeter level and um, uh, with the, on the accuracy side on the centimeter level. Um, uh, last message from my side, um, Fabio, you had it on your screens uh, about these, uh, let's say, running special issues. One of the special issues about bathymetry is uh, almost finished. Um, uh, it is also in the uh, Photogrammetry Remote Sensing and Geoinformation Science Journal, and a special issue about bathymetry from images, LiDAR, and sonar, which I was um, happy to uh, be able to, to organize, and some of the um, uh, presenters in the previous sessions had um, uh, valuable contributions to this uh, to this special issue, which is already online. M uh, most of the uh, articles are uh, already online and I expect the printed version uh, at any day. So this is uh, all from my side. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Gottfried, for this very interesting presentation. And uh, let's move forward to the next presentation from Elisa Costa from Universita Ca Foscari of Venezia. 
and she will give us a long presentation on underwater photogrammetry in the sea and the lagoon of uh, Venice. Elisa, the floor is yours. Hi to everybody. Hello and um, good morning. I would like to present uh, also my the team of uh, Kafoska University and uh, we work um, in underwater and also on maritime archaeology. So with uh, terrestrial um, uh, excavation and uh, we have uh, this is our website uh, and we have uh, a lot of uh, projects uh, some of these are uh, almost closed but uh, um, this last one uh, these last three are uh, ongoing uh, project and uh, most of uh, these uh, projects are uh, uh, explained uh, in uh, other uh, ESPRS and um, this is uh, uh, half of this is uh, underwater and uh, in particular uh, this uh, is uh, the, the team of Kaposkari and um, here the, the professor, me and uh, other experts in uh, navigation and uh, underwater archaeology but also in uh, digital uh, exhibit and uh, digital uh, uh, installation in a uh, museum and uh, me are um, specialized in uh, underwater survey and uh, photogrammetry. In these last two years uh, we start a collaboration and a very incredible collaboration with uh, Azione Mare that is a foundation from uh, Guido Guy, an engineer that uh, has this huge uh, cut, uh, an incredible cut about uh, 22 meters for nine and my house is uh, really really little and uh, he works uh, with um, these uh, ROVs in a um, very deep uh, uh, context. Uh, we have used in these uh, two years uh, both of uh, these uh, ROVs to document uh, uh, different uh, shipwrecks, so it is uh, a very important um, collaboration that we have started with um, with him to document uh, this uh, uh, incredible uh, marble cargo of a uh, Roman period with this statue. It's a strange uh, context because only this statue um, is uh, 100 tons uh, of uh, marble, so it is uh, an incredible uh, uh, engineering um, analysis that we have to to do with the him, and um, also this is uh, another shipwrecks uh, at uh, six and four uh, meter deeps uh, in the Tyrrhenian Sea. So it is uh, an important uh, uh, collaboration. So we work uh, from. Uh, uh, this uh, huge deep uh, shipwrecks from uh, the lagoon of Venice uh, and uh, this is a uh, um, a very uh, different uh, condition because uh, here we are on uh, two meters uh, of uh, depth to three meters of depth and uh, this is the context of uh, our excavation for uh, the last uh, uh, excavation site and the, here is uh, Venice, the Lagoon of Venice, with this big channel from uh, the seaside. That, uh, uh, in fact, the big challenge, challenge of the lagoon is connected with this channel and uh, the tides that uh, uh, during the day we are created with two different tides in the day that um, com comport. Uh, a strong, a really strong current, about uh, uh, two knots, and uh, in particular where there is the height range of uh, the current about one meter, one meter and a half of the different of uh, range, and uh, this uh, uh, high tides comports uh, a very low visibility, uh, in particular during the. Um, the tides because the, the, um, the tides move the, the mud and the sand from the bottom of uh, the lagoon. So in uh, this situation the photogrammetry it is possible only 
at the end of uh, the rising uh, tides and where the, um, the current is, um, uh, is not so strong and uh, the um, visibility is better and because of the rising tide the, the water comes from the seaside, the, the sea, so the, um, the water is cleaner. But in this condition the, um, the photogrammetry is possible only half an hour during the day. In uh, this condition we have realized uh, uh, different uh, type of uh, survey as a multi-beam uh, echo sounder we have uh, the bathymetry of uh, all this context uh, here the, the channel uh, and uh, here the, um, uh, the structure the Roman structure from uh, archaeology with a uh, particular and um, also the uh, we have used the uh, sub bottom profiler to understand uh, which is uh, also under uh, the bottom we have used uh, uh, a topographic survey with total station because uh, we are uh, near uh, near the land and only in three two three meters of depth so we we could uh, realize this uh, um, high pole uh, about uh, three four meters so we have used this to um, to obtain um, a particular topographic net to uh, to insert in the same reference system all of the different uh, photogrammetic survey that we have uh, obtained in different days because we can work only in uh, um, half half an hour during the day so it is uh, possible to obtain uh, only uh, a little portion of uh, the excavation uh, from for uh, a once photogrammetic survey so we have to uh, insert all of this in different uh, occasions so at the end of the excavation we make a, an announcement of uh, of the video of uh, the photogrammetic survey and the, all the images and we could obtain uh, all the excavation also in uh, this uh, uh, difficult condition and in fact the photogrammetric survey in uh, this uh, occasion is uh, really important uh, for uh, the also for the technical aspect from the photogrammetric survey but also and in particular um, because it is the only way to share the underwater cultural heritage that in this condition is uh, almost uh, invisible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elisa. And uh, let's move forward to the next presenter, which is uh, Oliver Kamen. Uh, from the Institute of Applied uh, Photogrammetry and Geoinformatics of JD University uh, Oldenburg in Germany. And he will present us uh, the group activities in a small presentation. So now you should see my screen. Yeah, but it's not on full screen. Uh, Should just changed. Give me a second. Yeah, I think you can just press F five. Yeah, I'm in the presentation mode, but it's swapped somehow. Okay. I, sw I swapped it, but it didn't work. So uh, okay. So Let's give it a Okay, I think we lost Oliver. Uh, should we wait for him to come? Ah, okay. So here I am, hopefully again. Can somebody hear me? Yes, we can hear you.
OK, perfect. So can you hear him right now? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we can see your screen. Hello. OK, you can hear me. Awesome. And also see my screen, hopefully, so I can start. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my name is Oliver Carmen. Sorry for that little delay. I'm a research associate of the Institute of Applied Photogrammetry and Geoinformatics at the Yadu University in Oldenburg at Professor Thomas Luhmann's group. And I'm going to show some introduction to our work in on water photogrammetry. And what we've done so far, we've done some simulations. So we do um, deal with synthetic data sets. So um, in this case, we, we have a calibration cube you can see on the left-hand side. And it was a real data set. So all these blue dots in the left corner indicate the acquisition positions and the red dots represent the calibration cube of a real data set. And we used this data set to do simulations. So we created synthetic image coordinates, uh, which are refracted by synthetic um, interfaces. So what we've done, we've done, uh, we've set up a stereo system with a baseline of 200 millimeters. You can see in that sketch on this uh, in here. And then we changed the interface. So for example, on the left-hand side here, you have the interface just in front of the lens. And on the other side, on the right-hand side, you have the interface shifted towards the object by, in this case, 1.5 meter. So we changed the interface in some setups and then we calibrated the camera. Um, so the, the stereo system in the relative orientation, also, of course, the interior orientation of the camera. And then we had a look at the, um, the relative orientation of the stereo setup and also of the interior orientation. Here, just the camera constant is shown. And here you can see from nominal, so in air calibration, um, the camera constant increases by the uh, refractive index of the water as well known by literature. And then you can see if we, if we shift the interface towards 50-50, so the path of light travels 50% through air, 50% through water, the relative orientation changes significantly in Z and also the camera constant changes by around half a millimeter significantly. So there are really high correlations within the uh, calibration process of the bundle adjustment. And when you use the stereo system, uh, these effects will scale your actual measurement when you like, let's say, let, leave the calibration and go to your actual in situ application. And this becomes interesting for us when we have a look at our application. Because what we do is we try to inspect welding lines on the water. You can, on the top right corner, you can see the welding line. And these welding lines are welded on the water and also need to be inspected on the water. And therefore, we have a single camera system set up in the housing of Blue Robotics with a three inch housing here. And we can translate the camera above the welding line. And what we do then is we do backward intersection uh, to get the exterior orientation of the camera by using the reference targets of this reference frame we can uh, put in into the welding line. And then we do image matching, for example, these squares matching uh, with two single images to get a 3D point cloud from two images. And then um, because we do this, this is interesting. We are really, really close to the object. So we have a path of light tra travel through just a little, a few centimeters through air and then a few centimeters through water. And in this case, we use a dome port um, not to deal with the refractive effects too much, but we are planning to also to use flat ports since we are limited in our dimensions to, to configure the system. And we've done some first tests in the lab. Uh, we used clean water, and then we can reconstruct the welding line quite well, having a standard deviation to a reference of uh, 0.05 millimeters. And when we do it in turbid water, 
it of course becomes uh, worse, but it's still quite good because we are aiming for a tenth of a millimeter in standard deviation, so that's still in our target uh, accuracy. And the turbidity of this water um, is about 20 centimeters, 20 centimeters uh, in visibility, so that's already quite bad, but in German waters you can you can have such conditions. So our aim is to, to build a setup where we can also deal with turbid water. Yeah, that's my short introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, I would also like to point out the call for papers by order of my boss, Thomas Luhmann. He and Professor Maas do that special issue uh, where you can yeah, submit your paper until 20th of August if you're willing to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver, for this presentation. And let's move to the next presenter, which is uh, Perti Arvonen from Uvis, of, uh, from Turku in Finland. And he will give us a bit presentation about uh, underwater navigation, communication, and surveillance for divers. Perti, are you here? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Do you do you see Uvis already? Yeah, we, we can see your screen. Very good. and. Uh, Thank you for, for this uh, possibility, first time here, so this is an honor for me. So I, I have a quick quick presentation. I try to explain the OV system for you first, and then I run to to, to photogrammetry process uh, supported by OVs very quickly. So um, you can find more information from our website, ovis.fi, back of Finland. So we started from the, the, the ultrasonic, uh, invention how to 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 send reliability the, the data through the water so that's key so that's why the always works in quarries harbors even swimming pools and that was the key and uh, the system consists of of diving units can be connected to a divers uh, tablets or ROVs and the surface we have uh, three boys so this is like uh, the floating LBL system and we have a tracker software which can uh, for, you can follow and and in the, um, and communicate it to the divers. So we can track even 100 divers if we if we like to. And we sell quite often this in a ready-made case where everything is included and, and maximum six divers in this one case. And uh, the tracker software is like this. So so we can receive some messages, arms. We can send messages to divers. Divers can send messages to us or to other divers. We, we can see point of interest and, 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 and so on. And we have done the cooperation so that uh, even the, 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 the site scan sonar software, this, in this case, Deep Vision is a Swedish company. They can listen our boy messages as well. So you can then drive your ROV right away to your findings and follow the ROV or, or divers above the, the mosaic of the of the sonar view and the specialty of the system is that we we can send the data down to to the diver as well so we have connection for example this auto tablet where is a samsung android tablet inside and you can see on the right hand side there is auto mosaic uh, the the picture of the grids hunden in sweden lund university have a system already and and you can navigate and 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 travel above the, 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 the model. And you, you can see your dive bodies, you can, you can send messages, alarms, SOS, you name it. And also the data is available for the cameras. We can also connect it to GoPro, so you can inject metadata during the dive inside the video. But also if you have a camera, you can, uh, with a timestamp, you can uh, uh, connect uh, location data uh, to the, the video frames or still images. And this is important for the photogrammetry. And this is how the, the data looks like. You can take right away to, to KML, to Google, or operate with, uh, with the raw data in, in Excel. And this is the latest case. Uh, this is in USA and, and CRA. Maybe you have seen that. that this is a, a very special design for the big area photogrammetry. And now, Last case was the big coral reef area. So they use for the navigation and also collecting data to the images. So, so that's, that's very powerful for the big areas at least. And, and this is the, and when you have a location data to images and underwater photogrammetry, 
you have already georeferenced uh, model and and uh, and there's many other uh, the benefits i can show you one thing which is uh, this kind of um, summary of of how to use how to use uh, always with the photogrammetry so first you can uh, take a shooting and, and navigate with the with the system uh, also if you don't need any navigation support you can just put uh, the one diver unit to your the backside and collect data and when we have a, a camera time known camera time and we have our gps time in our lock then we, you can combine the data later so for example this was in the Wobster uk the uh, photogrammetric case so there was a navigation um, collecting the data here first and then we make the one around the verso here and then we connect uh, collected the data uh, to the every image so we have every image have data of, of coordinates and altitude then and that's very valuable via csv file to metashape and the models are were excellent there is still a little bit open how much this location data helps in, in the photogrammetry model. But we have seen here in Baltic Sea, in the low visibility, that it definitely helps in, in navigation and also the, the aligning of the images. But it seems that uh, at least in murky water waters, the, the, the model itself is very good shape and all of the scaling is very accurate without any, any scaling bars. But still, the, all the benefits are a little bit under investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Perti, for this very nice presentation. And now we are moving to the last but not least presenter for today, uh, Christian Anastasi from the University Lumiere Lyon 2. And he will uh, present, uh, he will give us a long presentation uh, uh, on the geoarchaeological context in the underwater pile uh, dwelling site of uh, Prespa 1 in Albania. Christy? Hello, everybody. Do you see my screen? Yeah, but not in full screen. Now is it okay? Yeah, you can start. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my presentation is about the geoarchaeological context in the underwater pile dwelling site of Prespa 1 in Albania. First of all, I would like to, uh, to, um, to present where is situated the Lake Prespa. Uh, in this map, we have Albania in the Balkans, and uh, the Great Lake Prespa is situated in the southeast part of, um, of the state of Albania. Uh, now we move to the archaeological researches made in this area. As you can see in this bay, um, the research, underwater research has started uh, since uh, 2010 with systematic surveys until uh, 2017, where the the, the pile dwelling settlement uh, of Presta One was uh, was found. Um, in this um, in this area in this site, um, they took um, the, the team of archaeologists uh, uh, took some pottery samples, and the sample from a pile pile um, uh, underwater pile. Uh, as we can see, we have some materials here. And the sample from the pile, the radiocarbon date uh, with 95.4% 90, uh, dates of uh, 104,051 to 102,091 uh, before Christ. Um, now we, I would like to to move on to to this map. This is a, this uh, photo. This is a aerial photo of the bay by Albanian Air Force of 1953. And concerning the, the, the ge geo, um, geological part, we can see that uh, we have uh, a trace of the old river flow. And the, the river, the, the new uh, flow of the river of 1953, that is in this part. In, in these maps is more easy to show. Uh, we, we have um, a big change from the 19th century to the 20th and after to the 21st century all this area was filled 
and the, the, the lake shore was moved on the south part. The idea is that uh, in this area, uh, we would like to, to make a geoarchaeological researches by uh, making a lot of cores that will be analyzed and also the, the microflora and macrofauna will, will, will give us um, the, all the data that we could use to reconstruct the paleo environment, uh, the evolution of the paleo environment of this area. We, we can see in just two centuries, we have a big difference, but we would like to connect also with the, the archaeological sites situated in this area. Now, the problem of the team is that um, is concerning the, the underwater part of this lake, of the bay, because um, by, the, by the researches made, uh, a, a topographic maps give just the depth of minus meters and minus 20 meters. So the team, um, also the site is uh, from zero to minus 10. So uh, the, in this way, the team to create, uh, to understand the relief and the modeling of the bottom of this bay had to improvise a bathymetry by doing a manual, in a manual way, by systematic measurements. And uh, by all these systematic measurements, we have uh, created this map. Um, now, uh, to, to have a, current, a correct and detailed documentation, uh, me, but also the team, uh, we would like to ask uh, all the present here, all the specialists about which is the best way to make a scan of the bottom of the lake, um, of the bottom of this bay of the lake, because we could not use the um, photogrammetry underwater because of the limited visibility. As you can see in this picture, this is the best uh, visibility that we found, but normally we have this kind of visibility. So um, th this is a big problem uh, for us because we want to create a, a virtual container um, and uh, in this way we could, we could have a, a detailed documentation. Um, due to, to the time, uh, I would like also to thank Fabio and the organizer for giving me this opportunity to show all the researches made uh, on PRESPA1. And uh, we, we, me and also the team, we will be very pleased to know uh, which is the best way uh, to, to realize a scan on, on this part of the bay from zero meters to minus 10 meters. I will also write the question on the, on the site. Thank you everybody for your attention. Thank you, Christy, for the presentation. And now we can move to the questions uh, posed for this session. Okay, Panos, I can sh share my screen. Yes. Okay. Okay, the first one is addressed to Elisa and uh, from Manuela. Did you measure the visibility in the lagoon? Uh, Yes, we have used the Seki disc, but uh, only two times from uh, the boat. But we have understand, understood that the visibility, the turbidity of the water change a lot when you are uh, on the bottom due to the, um, the murky water in, uh, in the bottom for uh, the suspension of uh, uh, the um, of the bottom itself, and um, it was around uh, 40 centimeters to 70. So we have uh, used, uh, uh, we have realized the photogrammetry only with uh, the best uh, visibility that is around uh, 70 centimeters. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, may I pose something here that um, I can understand that visibility is a, is, a, is a big issue in general. And, yeah. uh, 
you may exploit also uh, Sentinel-3 data with the diffuse attenuation coefficient, uh, which can give um, an estimation of uh, turbidity. There is also a, a respective article of uh, Deria Akanyaka and uh, Talit Rebic. So um, Sentinel-3 data can help, help us uh, mm -hmm. estimate the turbidity and the visibility on the areas that we would like to map underwater or over water. Yeah, perfect. Well, yeah, this was to everybody. Okay, so uh, the second question uh, to Fabio Bruno, how did you model the haziness in the simulation? And if you calibrate uh, such uh, haziness with uh, real data, Fabio? Uh, I think uh, we can leave the, the chat on and maybe Fabio can answer after. So okay. maybe you, there's this question to all the participants, uh, panels in the very top. I don't know if you see it. Uh, from Christy. Uh, yeah, uh, the last one from uh, from Christy. Uh, yeah, it's a question that he posed uh, at the end of his presentation, and okay, I would like to to hear uh, any comments from all the participants here. Yeah, I think that the answer is uh, is not. Uh, straightforward and this uh, is very linked to the next poll which i can uh, start if you agree sure that depends on many 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 things uh, so there's uh, the accuracy the resolution i can leave it on yeah and this is a very important question because uh, we are working to improve the accuracy, to, to improve the, um, our results, but uh, everything depends on the application. And what are they I, creating? I for? have a question for, uh, for Elisa. I, yeah. I put it on the top. Yeah, I, I, I read it. But, um, but we, we put some targets, uh, simple targets, uh, across target black and uh, yellow and uh, white underwater uh, with uh, with the needle uh, on the blocks uh, because we have uh, um, a, a blocks uh, of sesquipedales uh, um, a material uh, a Roman material uh, so we, we could insert uh, in the middle between these uh, and uh, we have realized uh, before a trilateration underwater. And then, uh, obviously, we don't have uh, a night accuracy, uh, neither with the trilateration, neither with uh, the, the primes road for the total station, because uh, uh, we put uh, um, uh, a weight underwater uh, on, the, on the target and uh, um, a polycarbon tube uh, with some um, uh, I don't know the, the name in English of uh, molle that uh, uh, so try to, yeah try to um, to steal uh, the vertical pole for uh, of the prism, but uh, is change uh, uh, a lot of uh, the accuracy is not so high. Did you did you measure uh, the the prism uh, from uh, two stations? Uh, I mean, uh, do you have an idea of this error? It's in the order of uh, millimeters or a uh, few centimeters? Uh, Around uh, two centimeters. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, since we don't have any uh, other question, Fabio, would you like to close this uh, day? Yes. I switch on my webcam as well. Okay, uh, we have come to the end of the first day. It took uh, a little bit more than expected, but I, I think that everybody really wanted to share their uh, their latest updates. Uh, I leave you with the the latest poll as well. Uh, uh, this will be on uh, for. Uh, uh, the day uh, for today and also for tomorrow so you can be free to to vote at in uh, any moment um, and uh, I will uh, propose them again tomorrow so I would like to thank all the speakers and the participants we have people uh, from uh, 
from Australia who joined and now it's uh, I think uh, uh, time to, to let them uh, have a dinner uh, if it's not too late already and um, I would like to thank you all the, the speakers again uh, for this very successful first day uh, thank you all so I would stop the, re the, regis the record recording now and uh, uh, see you tomorrow Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.